church, but I just feel there's a necessity for us to speak specifically on the subject of the whole constitutional makeup of the heavens and how do we change the heavens and also the earth. So, if you want to give a title to the series, I would do it. It will take about three sessions. Um, Opening the heavens. Opening the heavens. I want at the outset to make some statements that I hope to qualify and clarify. In the course of the presentation of the teaching, firstly, I think we need to redefine in our conceptual understanding what the heavens are all about. We have to shift from trying to define the heavens um, from the mindset of our territorial positions. For many of us, including myself, heaven was a place of eternal bliss, but made relative to golden streets and Knight's Mansion and us being in eternal retirement and the paradigm for that was what happens to you in your old age. Am I correct? Now I am not saying and I'll leave that to your imagination that there's no golden streets and nice mansions. I'm not saying that. I am saying that heaven is more than your present definition and mine of what it is. You understand? Regrettably, we, we build our definition on mansions, John 14, 14 1, golden streets, Revelation 22. Those are only two references. We built such a theology of materialism based on a capitalistic understanding of heaven that we have staked all our future on those two mundane things and robbed ourselves of some of the greatest explorations into that dimension beyond this temporal world that we live in. And we preach some of our best sermons on the sensational because people love the material. We feed a covetous spirit that desires to go to heaven because they will get a better house and no potholes on the road <laughs> and also feed the lazy spirit that does not want to work anymore because we don't understand the whole idea of the heavens. Recently, there's been a lot of songs being sung. Some that have come with freshness. Sung by prophetic psalmist on opening the heavens. And God has given me a very simple, basic, doctrinal teaching on how we should view the heavens and how we can understand that the heavens are also transitionary stages in our journey. They are not a constant. The heavens and the earth will pass away. But there's only one constant. My words will not pass away. Think about this. Jesus said, John chapter 14, I go to prepare a place for you. You hear that? My father's house, there are many mansions. Actually, the rendering is so badly translated because basically the original Greek says, in my father's house there are many places. Many places. Paul understood it better when he said, we have been seated with Christ in heavenly places. You understand? And then it's also plural, not singular. 
plural, so it means that at the right hand, there are many dimensions, many facets, etc. Am I correct? Jesus said it in, in John. I go to prepare a place for you. I believe he did that when he went to the cross. And through the resurrection, he paved the way for us to be seated with him in those dimensions. I really believe that. That's my conviction. That's my interpretation to that portion of Scripture. I don't have enough Scriptures to qualify that, so I'll say, I, Thamo, say that. Is that fair? I have to be very careful here because this, this is what I'm going to present in the next few sessions can accuse me of being false in this area. And I don't want private interpretation to govern our presentation of truth. But think about this. Then if he comes to take us away, he says he's going to create for us new heavens and new earth. So before we can get to heaven, in the futuristic, the consummate, the benign position that we're going to get to, if he went now to prepare your house and it's taking so long, in fact it took six days to create the earth, 2,000 years to still build your house, And when he comes, he says he's going to create a new heaven and a new earth. And immediately cancels the whole position that heaven is a materialistic place. Am I correct? It has to be more. But we accept it. Why? Because we are very good believers. When we choose to be good believers... <laughs> But we are looking for an open heaven. Meaning, inferring that there are some heavens that are not opened. <coughs> Let me show you some examples. I want you to get this picture. Matthew 3.16 This is Jesus. He's on the face of the earth for 30 years. When he had been baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water. You got that portion? He came up immediately from the water. And behold, the heavens were? Question. Was it shut before that? And if it was shut, then was a dimension into that eternal, transcendental realm shut from the human race. And it took a certain position of the Christ to be able to bring it into an opening. And it never take place at the baptism in that he was being immersed. It only happened when he came out of the water. And the word for open, here. Yeah. Is the word anoigo, A N O I G O. Very interesting word because that word means to open up, but it's based on your positioning in the earth. In other words, the position of your relationship. With that invisible realm determines the opening up of the heavens. And then at that point, he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. Now, the word anoigo is very, I use this very simple analogy, and it's actually an excellent analogy because it. I will show you in the course of my discourse, maybe not today, but in the course of the discourse, I will show you that there's more than more, one heaven. There are many heavens. I will prove to you from the scriptures that the church has not yet raided the heavens and that the heavens have been presented to us in such a way where the level of our spiritual dimension or growth or development determines which heaven gets open to you. In other words, it's like there are many curtains 
And as you move out of one, into, uh, as you open one curtain, you move into a certain area. And if you want to move to the next level, you have to pass through another curtain and another curtain and another curtain. As somebody said, there are doors in heaven. I, John, was carried in the Spirit and I saw a door. The Spirit said to me, come in. You step into that dimension, you see a throne. There are many doors. That's why the Bible says to Peter, I give you the keys. How many? Is it singular or plural? Plural. I give you keys. Does that infer that there's more than one door? And as I would show you in Hebrews chapter 1, when the Bible says that the heavens will pass away or perish, the word for perish there means they must be raided, plundered and punctured. In other words, you can puncture a heaven, tear it apart, then you get to the next one. But the word anoigo is interesting in that that word means the positioning of an individual determines the automated response of a door shut. For example, I'm in a mall and as I come to a certain position, the doors automatically open and I pass through. You know that picture? Automated doors. Those days they didn't have it. But your position, if I am one yard too far from the door, it will stay closed. I have to be at an exact position before it opens, then I can pass through. And each level of the heavens comes in the form of a glory. Comes in the form of a glory. Because you can't see the fullness of God yet. That's why the picture of Jacob's ladder is so important. Every rung of the ladder brings you to a new level in God. But ultimately, there must be no more staircases or stairways, steps leading us up. Because now we are face to face with Him. Because He's always above the stairway. So the word anoigo means your positioning in the earth determines the automation of the door in the heavens that releases the dimension of the Holy Spirit upon that which is in the earth. Remember Jesus said it like this in John chapter 2. He said, from now on Nathaniel, you would see angels ascending And descending the Son of Man, the position of the man in the earth will determine the level of activity that takes place between the heavens and the earth. Are you getting that? That's why Paul said it like this. Paul said we move from glory to glory. It's a segmental journey towards a place called the finish. There's another portion of scripture, Mark 1.10. I'm going to give you lots of scriptures because you're building a theological framework of reference. Teachings like this, you don't just teach it, you have to found it in scripture. You can't make empty statements because we're dealing with a doctrine that goes back hundreds of years that kept the church in bondage. The apostolic culture challenges inaccurate foundations and deficiencies in the constitutional makeup of the body of Christ. Mark 1.10 And immediately, I like to see, I like you to see that the word immediately, it's got to do with the word suddenly. Suddenly. Sound came from heaven. Remember that? And immediately, coming out of the water, he saw the heavens parting. And the word here is S C H I Z Z O. Schizo. Out of which we get the word schism. And that word has to do with something splitting or being severed. To break something. To tear something. To rent it. To rent it. To tear it. Now this picture is giving you another dimension of how the heavens open. How does it open in this context? You don't only position yourself in such a way where the doors automatically open. 
But it gives you the picture that the heavens are, are, are shut and it has to be torn apart like the veil of the temple that was rent in two from bottom up. You understand? Torn apart. So there's a picture, and I'll show you later, Isaiah uses this, this, this analogy, this, this, this metaphoric way of describing this, when he says the heavens have been spread about like a curtain. God spreads it like a curtain. Like a curtain. And we have to learn how to tear it. There is a violence. The kingdom of God suffers violence. And the violent take it by force. There's an aggressive pressing into a dimension. If we want to move to new realms. It's, it's called the prevailing mentality. Now you have to understand that this is, this is apostolic culture we're talking about here. Because we read Second Chronicles or First Chronicles chapter 5 verse 1. Remember? It's Joseph, the firstborn. How did Judah become the leader? He prevailed over his brothers. Where did he get that spirit from? His father Jacob. Jacob prevailed over the angel. Whether it's a theophany or not, I don't know. But I do know that he wrestled with something where human proved that he can subdue a divine manifestation. That's what he did. He proved that he can wrestle through the night. Because the strength in us is not human. It's not human. There's a prevailing nature that it can even change the mind of God. In fact, God loves us to wrestle with Him. Prevail. Press. Push. Tear. And when we get to Hebrews, I'll show you the exact Greek words. In fact, the word for tearing there or the heavens passing away or, or the heavens would fade. Oh, what's the word there? Perish. The word perish literally means the sound of stampeding horses. They cause such a din on the ground that something shakes in the heavens. And the picture of us in the future is the picture of horses with eyes of lions. That's a picture. We create such a sound that it causes a tremendous reverberations. In the heavens, it actually starts to tear things so that we can move to the next level. That's how God's done it. That's why even beyond the veil of the temple, there are degrees in the spirit. If all of us could go to the ultimate levels, then our present constitution would probably disintegrate. God has chosen in such a way to veil certain things so that we won't see the fullness of his face like Moses' face was veiled until we come to a place where we are like him. In other words, your level of spiritual growth determines the level of your revelation of Christ. Acts 7.56 Stephen said, Look, I see the heavens opened. And now you go, the first one. And the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Do you know right now there are veils over your minds? Even though you can see, you're saved, you're born again, you're washed in the blood, there's still veils. Your position, that's why Job said it nicely. He said, I've heard of him by the... Hearing of the ear. But now my eyes see him. And how did he see him? He saw a dimension of God he could not see in Job chapter 1. He had to get to the last chapter of Job. He had to see him from that vantage point of having lost everything. He saw something that he could not conceive with his ears. There's a positioning. Now I want to say that at the outset here because I really believe we're exploring dimensions in the spirit. We're in the places that have not been heard of before, even though there's nothing new in the earth. But for us to be able to do it, we have to understand this whole idea that the heavens are a transitory place. They shall pass away. And we determine how they pass away. 
Okay? The church has to come to a place where we function from an open heaven. Not from the tradition of the past, but from an open heaven. Is that an understanding? Is that an understandable fact? A church has to function from an open heaven. But whenever something proceeds from the heavens, it starts to inform and influence our behavior in the earth. In fact, right now, the revelations we receive determines the positions we adopt in the earth. Our behavior is influenced by our belief system. The revelation we receive is the raw materials with which we build uh, the houses of God in the earth. I am so convinced that when, uh, when Moses climbed the mountain and got a pattern of the heavens, on the level of his discovery, and he didn't know everything. Let me tell you something. Moses, including all the angels in the heavens right now, don't know everything. They are limited in the knowledge. Moses did not know everything. According to Hebrews chapter 7, he did not even know that the priesthood will change from Levi to Judah. He was restricted. But what he knew, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 3, like a faithful servant, he built according to all that he saw. And on the level he saw, he built a copy and a shadow of heavenly things. Am I correct? Including the furnishings. He built it and it was a photocopy of everything in the heavens. But he saw on that level. He could not see the things that some of us are seeing right now. But what did he do? The veil of that which he saw, he brought that and that became the tabernacle in which he built the house. And then in his time, he was absolutely apostolic. But when David got another picture... That which was apostolic in a previous season, that was the, the, the veil and the, uh, and the covering of Moses' time. When David came and built something or provided the pattern, the design for his son to build it, uh, immediately that picture of the heavens became more clearer and uh, Moses' temple had to be made redundant or tabernacle. If you still operated in Moses' when, when Solomon's is in the earth, then Moses' will be uh, 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 an inaccurate position that, that's equated to an apostate position and automatically uh, it will be in judgment by virtue of a more accurate position in the earth. Are you getting that? So we have to all the time place a demand for an open heaven. Ezekiel 1.1 1, 1. Is interesting. Everything that an apostolic people receive, they receive it from an open heaven. Peter said it in Second Peter like this. He said, "This we received when we, this we heard when we were with him on his most holy mount, highlighting apostolic witness." We are witnesses of a heavenly culture. Now it came to pass in the 13th year, 30th year, in the fourth month, on the fifth day of the month, as I was amongst the captives. Remember, this guy is in, in captivity in Babylon by the river Cheba, away from his zone of, 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 of ministry, which is in Jerusalem, in the temple, he's a priest. That the heavens were opened. And when the heavens were opened, what happened? He saw visions of God. You know, a few schools ago, literally, I'm talking about literally, I wish we, we sometimes need to get people that can, can probably just record in detail. Um, all the prophecies that are released over the school, because some of it is amazingly awesome, because in one school we literally saw a heaven open. Literally saw it. And there was a signet ring, signet ring, with God releasing new, new truths, new revelations, uh, and sending it with the seal of his signet ring on it. Tremendous letters 
to us that we will read to the nations. We saw it. Literally, it was an awesome time. Only now we're beginning to understand that there are so many heavens that are still hidden from the church and they need to access it so that we can go where no man has gone before, which is part of the prototype of the culture of the church that God wants to build. That's why He gave us the Holy Spirit as a guarantee of this, that we would see things that Christ could not explain to us while He was on the earth, but He said the Holy Spirit will reveal it to you in due time. In Joel chapter 2, Joel, you battling with my accent all of a sudden after you heard his? I just want you to know that I don't have an accent. Joel? Joel. Do it the English way, the proper way. Okay, Joel. I became all things to all people. To the weak, I became weak. To the strong, I became strong. I'm not going to talk too much on this now, but we'll go back to this portion. I would suggest that you go and read it. Most people have described this, Joel chapter 2, Joel chapter 2, as the army of Antichrist. It's not the army of Antichrist. It's the army of God. And one of the pictures there is that the army will be described as horses. And this is what it says. Let's read it. Let's read it. Let's not leave it in case we never get back to it. Who knows, the Lord may just come tonight. (laughs) See, some of you are not ready, so you can't say amen. (laughs) Blow the trumpet in Zion. Sound the alarm on my holy mountain. Remember, Zion. Let all the inhabitants of the land trample. This is, this is a move initiated in the heart of the elevation of God. The seat of divine governance. Release a sound. That's the move, a new move. Let all the inhabitants of the land. That's an earthly position. For the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. What kind of a day? This is not the day of the devil. This is not the day of the Antichrist. This is, this, these are misrepresentations of good scriptures. It's a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like blackness spread upon the mountains. A great and powerful army comes. Their like has never been from of old. Imagine you've never seen an army like this. Even David's army can't be compared with this army that's coming forth. Nor will be again after them in ages to come. So even in the future, that army will not won't be seen. Man, I'd like to think that's us. Fire devours in front of them. Wow. Their presence is so awesome that the fire goes ahead of them. And behind them, a flame burns, so they leave a trail. Before them, the land is like the Garden of Eden. Everything is nice. But after them, a desolate wilderness and nothing escapes them. I mean, this is like a radar system. I mean, you know what? The apostol- uh, apostolic anointing, whenever it comes, it causes great desolation. It causes great confusion in organized people's lives. I mean, we get to turn the world upside down and mess up all things. Before God comes and takes chaos and makes it cosmos. Look at this now. They have the appearance of horses. And I'm going to talk about that before the school is over. And like war horses, they charge. You seen a war horse? And that thing knows how to snort. Look at the teeth of a horse that's trained for battle. Look at the eyes. 
And as with the rumbling of chariots, they leap on the tops of the mountains. You know, this portion, if you go into the original Hebrew, it means they just jump from one peak to another. They don't go down the valley and get to the next peak. It's like they just shift from one high level in God to another high level. They keep just, they're skipping like Santa Claus from one mountain to another. From one rooftop, one chimney to another chimney. I mean, that's a nice way. I mean, you're getting a picture of that with the Bliknots and Ramashias and all the other guys that are sharing. They're just jumping from one level. You're like, they're not going to stop. Then after all, there's no limit to the season. There's no ceiling to it. The sky is not the limit. That's not a terminology we use in apostolic circles because we've got no limits. We're learning how to move from an open heaven. Like the crackling of a flame of fire devouring the stubble like a powerful army drawn up for battle. Before them, people are in anguish. All faces grow pale. Like warriors, they charge. Like soldiers, they scale the wall. And David said it like this. He said, uh, one man with God can scale the highest wall. And think about the walls, not as a small little wall. Think about walls of cities. Think about Jericho, where a chariot, a horse-drawn chariot can drive. A truck, they say. Today's modern-day trucks could ride on those walls. And these guys just skip over it. There's no boundaries, in other words. There's no limitations. There's no barriers. There's no restrictions. These guys are dangerous. But look at this. this is, they don't only cause problems in the earth. Each keeps to his own course. I love this. Go and study the Greek on this. They do not swerve from their paths. In other words, each man knows his rank. Each man knows his place. Uh, each person... Knows uh, his frequency. They're not intimidated by anyone around them. They're absolutely focused and organized. They have spiritual formation. Each keeps to his own course. And they do not swerve from their path. In other words, they do not get distracted from what they call to do. They focus. I mean, I was just marveling today, just listening to all the speakers. Yeah, these guys are just coming. Each one got his own style, his own flavor, his own spice. Some are mild, some are hot. Some have chilies in it. But you put them all together, we're getting one of the most compounded anointings, busting up systems. Words are going beyond these walls into the nations as we speak resonating in places, causing angels to rejoice and dance at the thought that these manifestations could be taking place in the earth. They must be scratching their heads. Just look at some angels looking and saying, God, you kept this hidden from, from us? You didn't want to show it to us? You were waiting for the church to reveal your secrets to us? And they're leaning over and must be just rejoicing at one of the thoughts we just decoded. Just think about it. They do not jostle one another. Each keeps to his own track. They burst through the weapons and are not halted. I mean, no weapons. I mean, think about it. It's like mighty men and women. You shoot them, they just take the bullet, throw it one side and carry on going. You try to pull them down, they just brush it off. It's like, come on, the biggest devil is like a little fly. But you... Just act like it never bites you. They leap upon the city. They run upon the walls. They climb up into the houses. They enter through the windows like a thief. You don't even know when they come in. The earth, now there's a, there's a portion. The earth quakes before them. And the heavens tremble. Think about that. Can we cause the heavens to move? Can we shake the heavens? If we produce a position in the earth. Now look at this. The two greatest luminaries. The governing body during the day. That makes sure there's illumination. And the one in darkness. The sun and the moon. Are darkened. 
There's no more need for, for the sun and the moon, which are symbolic types of prophetic demonstrations, giving light anymore. They lose their shine. They get dark. The stars withdraw from their shining, and I will read Psalm 19 for you. But prophetic apostolic declarations that comes through creation or cosmologies. They withdraw their shining because no more now does the sun have to give light, the moon light at night, and the stars telling you the stories about God because this army is doing everything. They're shaking the heavens like a fig tree and everything in it that's ripe falls into its kairos. Just coming into the earth. The Lord utters His voice at the head of His army. Whose army is this? How vast is His host. Numberless are those who obey His commandments. Truly the day of the Lord is great. Terrible indeed. Who can endure it? I'm talking about opening the heavens. I'm showing you a position of how we can cause the heavens to tremble. Man, I see this. I feel it. Last night something was happening here. Eruptions. I like the way he puts it. Supernatural. Manifest. You will never know what happened last night. It will take a few weeks to process it. To feel what happened. Something was happening. It was the sound of an army emerging out of this place. In a very, very awesome way. Joel 2.30 says, You can go and read everything. Isn't that exciting? And I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth. Portents, wonders in the heavens and the earth. And on the, and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. Those are all different manifestations of the messages that God is going to reveal to us. I mean, I will show blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Great manifestations will come from the heavens and in the heavens and in the earth. Now, how many minutes do I have? Seven. My God, how do I do this? We have to stop here. Stop in the middle of nowhere, but that's fine. We'll finish this. I don't want to start something seven minutes and then leave it hanging. We're going to start to study how God created the heavens and the earth. Why in Genesis 1.1, God created the heavens plural, the earth singular, and proved to you that the heavens is not referring to our cosmologies, the stars, the sun, the galaxies, and all of that. That's just the cosmos, one dimension of creation, the visible dimension. I start to show you that the heavens is, a, is reflecting also the spiritual dimension and how that dimension is waiting for us to explore it as the true sons and daughters of God. Okay? We'll go upon that. But I want you to go home and just meditate on Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2. And get yourself this idea that I'm a horse. And he's going to ride upon this horse called Judah into battle. And that the strength of this house will outpace angels. Remember Jeremiah chapter 12 verse 5. If you have run with men and have become weary, how will you compete with horses? How will you compete with horses? I tell you that we're moving to a place of superhuman strength. Of supernatural manifestations. Of divine revelations. Of outpourings that you've never had. Do not trade this move of God. For any little pleasure in this season. Don't trade it. One of the greatest days of God is in our realm of existence. And some of you, as you're positioning, you're going to see new heavens open up to you. Okay? Let's stop there. Let's stop there. I'm not going to go any further. Just lift your hands to God. Ask Him to give you the understanding the grace to fully comprehend. Because none of this can happen by our activity. It's a sovereign move of God. Revelation is divine disclosure. You can't get a revelation. It's given. You can't invent it. Unless He opens your eyes, you can't see it. 
But your positioning can determine the heavens being opened. Father, something is happening. We know it. We feel it. It's resonating in our spirits. We realize there's a journey to go. But help us, Lord, to position ourselves for it. That the heavens will not be like brass. But we realize there are dimensions still to be opened, plundered, explored. Help us to understand it. Now we can understand why there are so many heavens, yet one earth. You're an amazing God. I'm praying now, Lord, for a special impartation of grace. That through our meals, through our fellowship, through our coming together in the evening, things will start to to reverberate in the spirits of your people. And while they're eating, they'll have open visions. Lord, I'm asking for that. Do it as a special favor. Open visions. Sudden revelations. That while they are talking on one level, they're seeing things on another. Lord, even if it has to take people just having wonderful encounters with angels right now, just, just to make this realm a reality to them. It's like Gideon sometimes. Some people need to place a fleece. God, some of us are too weak to fully comprehend all the things. So, Lord, I'm asking you, please, through this day into the night, let something happen. Let this whole school now will shift to another level of divine engagement and encounter. And may it become a record in their journey that that encounter helped to position them for the descent of the Holy Spirit on a level they'd never experienced before. We realize there's many baptisms. But all baptisms come from you. The baptizer in the Holy Ghost. Now give it to us, Lord. There are seven spirits in the Holy Spirit. We want all that we will be complete. We give you glory. We give you honor. We bless you. Hallelujah. Amen. You believe that this prayer can be answered? You prepare to make him... You're really prepared to trust God for it? So have a...